Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Game Week 31 team selection. I wildcarded last week so we'll take a look at how the wildcard got on in Game Week 30, look ahead to Game Week 31 and future transfer plans as well. If you do enjoy today's video please do smash that like button and if you're new around here make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, before we start today's video, two important things to note. Firstly, I hope you have a fantastic week ahead and you achieve everything you set out to. But secondly, there is a Game Week 31 deadline looming. So the Game Week 31 deadline is on Tuesday evening. So do not miss it. It's a midweek deadline, which means a couple of things. We've got lots of deadlines coming thick and fast. You need to make your moves. But also the content will be slightly different this week. Obviously, team selection on Monday morning. There'll be a deadline decisions on Tuesday morning and a deadline stream on Tuesday evening. So make sure you tune into the deadline stream to see what moves I make for 31 and to get that latest team news as well. So I'm recording this on Sunday evening, ready for a Monday morning upload. So the football has all just finished. So when I react directly to the football, I always feel a little bit more knee-jerky and emotional rather than being completely logical and analytical. But I did wildcard in game week 30. I finished on 68 points and that was a 20K green arrow. I'm delighted, genuinely. I think there were quite a few points left on the table, which I'll discuss in a second, but I also got lucky in a few ways too. And generally, if you'd have offered me a 20K green arrow this week, I would have taken it because whilst my team looked good on paper, this was actually the week where I felt like I could have had most damage against my team. Watkins had a great fixture. Solanke had a good fixture, very highly owned as well. Obviously, Solanke's fixtures continue to be good, but lots of people have him. Watkins, lots of people will now sell, but the Wolves at home fixture, I was terrified of not owning him. I obviously sold Madison on my wildcard. I was really worried about that. Went for you, Doggy, instead of Porro. Didn't own Foden. Captain Salah instead of Son. Benched Saka. When I actually looked at the start of the game about all of the risks potentially that I took with my team, it could have gone horribly. And so a 20k green arrow, I'll absolutely take that. And it's a really nice start to the wild card. I'll quickly go through the team, but I'll try not to spend too long on it because we want to move on to game week 31. But the defense continued to be the defense, right? This is the way defenders have been in FPL all season. There were three clean sheets, in fact, for game week 30, which was one for Aston Villa. And I did sell Pau Torres on my wild card, which I saw coming from a mile off. And then obviously Manchester City Arsenal ended nil-nil. And if you had the likes Gabriel and Saliba, very well done there. But for most people, they're probably looking at not having many clean sheets once again. So Petrovic and Gusto, very disappointing. I mean, conceding two goals to Burnley, especially considering for large spells that game, they only had 10 men Burnley. It goes to show that Chelsea aren't the best defense. And for most weeks, I probably don't want to play the double up unless the fixture is very, very good. But Gusto obviously came off injured and I might not have him anyway. As of the time of me recording this, I don't have an update on Gusto, but that was obviously very disappointing. But considering there weren't many clean sheets in game week 30 anyway, I'm not too disheartened by the fact that they both obviously lost their clean sheet. I went for you, Doggy, instead of Porro to save money, and I'm delighted I've done that. We'll discuss that in the next section when we go through my team, because I think I'm going to need that money. So going for you, Doggy, instead of Porro so far hasn't backfired, and obviously it's given me more flexibility with my transfers. But the star of the show in defense was actually Connor Bradley picking up four points. No attacking returns, but he picked up two bonus points because he was just brilliant. The data for him was strong, but not brilliant. I think if you watched the game, you might have thought his data would be through the roof, but it was just pretty good. But he definitely had the opportunity to both get goals. He had a couple of shots, but he also created a few chances for Salah too. And I suppose sticking on the theme of Liverpool, I don't feel robbed as such as a Salah captain, but I certainly think on another day, as we'll discuss when we look at some interesting stats in the next section. On another day, I genuinely believe Salah comes away with multiple returns. Given the strength of his finishing, given how clinical he usually is, I think he comes away with two or three attacking returns there. But also, Palmer and Song could have had a lot more as well. So I'm not trying to sound too hard done by it, but watching that game, seeing Bradley and Salah combine for multiple chances, it was a little bit painful. And obviously, because he missed so many chances... Salah only came away with seven points because he was nowhere near on bonus points. Because again, every time you have a shot of target, you lose bonus points. Miss big chances, you lose bonus points too. So he wasn't close to bonus. And therefore, despite the fact that he did get a goal, he obviously was outscored by both Son and Palmer. So the three major captaincy options this week all returned. Palmer was the big one. I'd love to know down below if you captain Palmer, well done. Because if you looked at all of the polls on social media, on my YouTube channel... 
Most people were choosing between Son and Salah, and Palmer was the best option. We discussed in the Game Week preview video that this game against Burnley definitely suited Palmer. He obviously got a penalty too, which helped, but Palmer is just an elite FPO option. And well done if you did choose to captain Palmer, despite Son and Salah being the most popular too. But I only lost out on a few points. If I'd have captained Son instead, I would have gained three points. If I'd have captained Palmer instead, I would have gained eight. So it's not a massive difference, and it's not a massive loss, considering I own all three of them. Darwin was really quite rubbish, in all honesty. Salah and Bradley could have had a hat full of, chance, hat full of goals and assists, but Darwin didn't really get that many chances in the game. And a little bit concerning, I suppose, ahead of Sheffield United, but he did come off a little bit early. So hopefully that was a bit of rest. And when Gakpo came on, he was just shocking once again. I didn't think he created absolutely anything. His touch looked awful. So this has made me more confident of a Bradley and Darwin start against Sheffield United, which is the game that I obviously really, really want them for. Outside of that, Garnacho one-pointer. Garnacho was pretty rubbish. Man United were very, very rubbish. And I don't particularly want to own Manchester United players moving forward. But I am lucky that Assuming no further injuries, I shouldn't need to play Garnacho for the next couple of weeks against Chelsea and Liverpool. So Garnacho one pointer wasn't great. I played Garnacho instead of Saka. Saka got three points. My theory around it was Saka's not going to get many chances, if any, against Man City. And he didn't really. He created one chance for Gabriel Jesus at the back post. But outside of that, Saka didn't really do much against Man City. So the thought process was there. It just turned out that Garnacho absolutely stinks, along with Manchester United. But I think it's more of a Manchester United problem than a Garnacho problem. I just spoke, obviously, about Palmer and Son. They did very, very well. Should have potentially captained them, but the fixtures were definitely there to attack. Haaland, two-pointer. I wasn't expecting a massive amount from him this week. And again, along with Saka, didn't get many chances. And in all honesty, no one got many chances in that Arsenal-Man City game. It was a very, very cagey affair. And then just to finish off with the man of the hour, which is Izak. Without Izak, this wildcard looks a lot, lot worse. So again, I said that I felt slightly hard done by captaining Salah this week, given the amount of chances he's had, and Bradley could have had more. But also, both penalties were slightly questionable, especially the second penalty for Newcastle. So to get two penalties and an assist from Izak, I will absolutely take that. But I will just say, Izak was very, very good in that game. The assist was exceptional. But most importantly, he was on for 90 minutes and towards the back end of the game, he was still sprinting. And that's what I loved about that performance from Izak is that he does look fully fit. And if he stays fully fit, he will start every game for Newcastle, given that obviously Callum Wilson is out and they're still going for those European places. So really, really happy ha happy having Izak. And the fact that they picked up three points, I think only makes him a better option because they have everything to play for now. So to summarize, in general, some good luck, as you always expect in FPL, with the likes of Bradley getting bonus points, Izak getting his double penalty, but also some bad luck, because I think some of my players could have potentially got some more points, but it tends to even itself out in FPL. I'm pretty happy with the 20k green arrow, not going to complain anymore. So let's now move on to game week 31. So guys, before we take a look at my team for Game Week 31, I thought I'd just go through some interesting stats from Game Week 30, which is sometimes quite useful to do. But I always caveat this section by saying that single game stats aren't always the most indicative thing moving forward. We try to look at stats over a much larger sample size and saying that this player had decent or bad stats in one game completely ignores the game state. It ignores sort of big defensive areas as well. Like say one defender slips over and it falls to the striker. They might have really good data, but they did absolutely nothing in that game. So obviously apply some common sense, apply the eye test that you've watched the games over the weekend. But these are some interesting stats from Game Week 30, which I wanted to discuss. So firstly, on Salah, I kind of spoke about the fact that he obviously had a fantastic game from an underlying data perspective. In fact, only two players had over one non-penalty expected goals in Game Week 30. And I'm specifying non-penalty there because obviously the likes of Isaac and Palmer had higher, but they did have penalties. So only two over one non-penalty expected goals, which was Brereton Diaz, who had an ex exceptionally good game and then Mohamed Salah but Diaz was at 1.02 Mohamed Salah at 1.49 so Salah was in a league of his own for goal threat from open play in game week 30 which is I suppose just a continuation to be saying he could have had a lot more in game week 30 interestingly on the defenders there were only two defenders in game week 30 that had over 0.5 XGI, which was actually Gusto and Eight Nuri. Now, I obviously started Gusto, benched Eight Nuri. Eight Nuri's was all in one chance. So Eight Nuri just had a big, big chance from about three or four yards out. And Martinez pulled off an absolute wonder save. But he just keeps getting in the right positions. And I think Eight Nuri, assuming he's okay, by the way, because there were he did come off early and there were some doubts around whether that was an injury or whether it was just him having his minutes managed. But if Aitnuri is fine, which we assume he is at the moment, 
And if Gusto is fine, which we don't yet know, these are two players that will just get a lot of chances. And Gusto's data in that game wasn't just from one chance. He was very, very good once again. So maybe Gusto and eight Nuri owners slightly unlucky not to get more in game week 30. But I really do think that unless you're choosing someone like an Arsenal defender... Going for attacking defenders is the way forward because clean sheets just aren't happening. So why not try and at least get some attacking returns? And Gusto and Aitnuri, whenever they're fit, are two really decent players to target. On shots, we're back on Salah here. Salah had the most shots in game week 30, followed by Palmer. And Palmer was just brilliant, by the way. Even ignoring the penalty, Palmer was just exceptional once again in game week 30. And then Tony. Tony had nine shots in game week 30. I sold Tony on my wild card. If we're talking about luck, I'm very lucky that he didn't come away with three or four attacking returns. Man United were awful, as we'll discuss in a second. And Tony had so many chances in that game. So you can feel very hard done by if you are a Tony owner. I also want to discuss sticking on the theme of Liverpool because they were one of the more impressive teams, again, underlying data-wise in game week 30. Luis Diaz had the highest non-penalty big chance involvement in the league, joint with Salah, Palmer, Wissa, and again, Brereton Diaz. So if you're looking for a cheeky pun in game week 31, everyone's going to flock to Salah. They maybe will look at a defender like Bradley and maybe even look at a Darwin, but don't don't forget to consider Luis Diaz. He's been really, really decent in recent weeks. I think he's starting to find his form again. And the underlying data has been pretty decent. And as you can see here, big chances galore for him in game week 30. I think he created two big chances and had a big chance himself. So definitely consider Luis Diaz, especially if you've got that free midfield slot as well. He is quite expensive, but might be worth trying to squeeze in. Again, they've got double game week 34 coming up Liverpool as well. So I don't mind Luis Diaz as a pick. Moving on to some team data, Chelsea, Spurs and Liverpool had the highest non-penalty expected goals in game week 30. So even removing that penalty that obviously Cole Palmer had, Chelsea was still highly impressive, but they were playing against 10 men of Burnley for a large spell of that game. So maybe do consider obviously the context of the game within that. Spurs had 3.12 non-penalty expected goals. So again, if you own lots of Spurs attackers, maybe you own Madison and Son, maybe slightly unlucky not to come away with more there. And Liverpool, again, had the third highest non-penalty expected goals in game week 30. Most of that came from Mohamed Salah. When we're looking at the best three defences in game week 30, Spurs, Liverpool and Brentford had the lowest non-penalty expected goals. So again, if you own the likes of Udogi, Porro, Bradley, Van Dijk, maybe feeling quite hard done by not getting some attacking returns. And Brentford actually defended for once fairly well. Maybe that is more indicative of Manchester United being very, very weak, but Brentford had a strong game. And sticking on the theme of Manchester United and Brentford, Manchester United conceded the most non-penalty big chances in game week 30 at six. Six big chances conceded. Not, no penalties, just from open play. So Manchester United are a state at the moment. And Chelsea play them next week. So if you've got the likes of Palmer and Jackson, you could be in for an absolute monster haul. So those are some interesting stats from game week 30. If you have any of your own, let me know down below in the comments. So guys, going into game week 31, I have one free transfer and 1.2 million in the bank because I obviously wildcarded in game week 30. And as I said before, I'm delighted I left that money in the bank because I did get hit by a couple of injuries in game week 30 that I'm going to probably have to deal with either this week or very, very soon. The plan was to always roll a transfer in game week 31 because ideally you would like to roll a transfer the week after you wildcard. But given the two injuries in defense that I currently have and a possible injury in the attack and obviously some, we're unsure why eight Nuri was subbed off if that was just his minutes being managed etc I could be forced into making a transfer so I'll present my team discuss the possible transfer options that I have as well because if I do have to make a transfer I, I won't hesitate to do that it's obviously not ideal but looking ahead to future weeks I don't have that many transfers that I need to make desperately so I am okay making a transfer this week if I have to the team is currently rated at 93% according to Fantasy Football Hub. That has dropped slightly, but I am projected to get 69.6 .6 points this week, which is one of the highest that I have seen in a single game week, not including those obviously where we have doubles. So I'm pretty happy with the way the team looks. And starting off with the defense, if all of my defenders that are currently in the team are fit for game week 31, I'm going to be very, very happy. I obviously chose David Raya, who kept a clean sheet in 30 because of his fixture in game week 31. Someone did email me, interestingly, with a stat. And by the way, thank you for sending that email across because it was very interesting that I think Luton are on like the, the longest streak of scoring goals in the Premier League out of all teams. Like Luton score in basically every game they play. I didn't actually fact check it myself, but sounds about right. Most teams don't keep clean sheets against Luton. So I'm not saying don't play your Arsenal players. Of course, we have other issues to deal with and it is still a good fixture. But 
Luton do tend to score goals. So I'm not, I don't think this is a clean sheet banker, but I am very happy having some Arsenal defensive cover because we saw against Manchester City just how good they are defensively. Yes, they gave up a few chances, but City are one of the best attacks in the world, especially at the Etihad. So very, very happy having David Raya. Petrovic drops to the bench. I will just say... Manchester United were absolutely awful against Brentford. If they repeat that, I would not be surprised to see a clean sheet from Petrovic. So maybe I do consider it, but I mean, the whole point of picking Raya was to play him this week. So I'm pretty sure I'll be playing David Raya. Then moving on to the three defenders, I'm actually very happy with them because they are all very, very attacking. And in weeks where... I mean, clean sheets, I would hope, are slightly more likely this week. But considering that clean sheets haven't been very common this season, having attacking defenders feels very, very good. And they're all pretty cheap as well. Starting with eight Nuri, like I said, he was very good in the game against Aston Villa, but he did come off relatively early. Having heard from some Wolves fans and those that watched the game, no one saw an injury. It sounds like he was just having his minutes managed. Hopefully it was a positive thing, i.e. they want to make sure that he is fit and available. And therefore they thought, you know what, he's played a lot of minutes recently, let's bring him off. Rather than it being a bit of rotation, because if he is happy rotating eight Yuri, there's always obviously the chance that he does bench him for the odd game. So fingers crossed it was a positive management of his minutes. And I would expect, assuming that he's fit him, to play the Burnley game. If you were looking to bring him in, I don't want to put you off, but maybe just wait to double check that there wasn't any reason in particular that he was taken off. But assuming that he's fit and available, eight Neary against Burnley away feels very, very good. Burnley have actually been attacking relatively well recently. So clean sheet potential, I think is good, but not great. But attacking potential is very, very high. Maybe a slightly more reason to think there could be a clean sheet is that actually Wolves are better away defensively. So their defensive days, they're something like seventh for non-penalty expected goals conceded this season away, whereas they're about 14th, 15th at home. So they're actually better defensively away. So fingers crossed, we could get either a clean sheet or an attacking return from Aiton Yuri, and I am very, very happy to have him slightly longer term in my team. On you, Doggy, no, it's not a perfect victory against West Ham away. And again, no, I'm not expecting a clean sheet for Spurs anytime soon, really. But he does still carry some attacking threat. And in a week where I have two other injured defenders... I am very happy and comfortable playing you, Doggy. And then Bradley, there was always a slight concern, and there still is, I suppose, that Bradley might be benched for this fixture. The reason that I think I'm that's less likely now is simply because Gomez also played at left back. So the only other player I think realistically that would play instead of Bradley is Gomez. But Gomez also played against Brighton. And I don't think Gomez was fantastic. And Bradley really was fantastic. Maybe a little bit suspect defensively at points, but generally had a very strong performance. So given that Bradley was excellent, Gomez also played in that game. So it's not like Gomez is fresh and going to come in for Bradley. I would be now more surprised at least if Bradley wasn't in the starting 11 against Sheffield United at home. But obviously you can't confirm that. And if he does miss out, I could be in a little bit of trouble. But I'm just going to start him, hope that he plays. And if he does play, based on what we saw against Brighton at home, this could be a really, really good fixture for him. We know that Liverpool are very strong at home. Sheffield United have improved slightly recently, but they've also been attacking a little bit more too. So that might actually suit Liverpool a bit. I'm expecting Liverpool to go absolutely all out in this game to score goals. So maybe the clean sheet isn't as likely, but attacking returns certainly are. So that defense, I'm actually extremely happy with. I have Luton, Burnley and Sheffield United as the fixtures to target. I've got obviously an Arsenal defender and a Liverpool defender, and they are some of the best defenses in the league. Very, very happy with that. My issue is if any of them are a doubt or any of them do miss out, obviously I've got Petrovic that can come on for Raya, but defensively with Gusto and Lascelles injury, I now have a bit of an issue. So on Lascelles, he's apparently ruptured his ACL and he's out for six to nine months. So Lascelles is done for the season, done for me, and therefore I do need to replace him at some point because I'm looking to bench boost in 37. I'm not necessarily in a rush to do so because the first week that I was planning to play Lascelles is actually game week 35, and I don't think that his ownership is high enough to trigger a price fall. So I could be wrong there, but I don't see him falling in price particularly soon. And if I don't need to play him until 35, it's not a transfer that I need to rush right now. I suppose my concern with not making the transfer now is obviously Gusto's injured. And if Gusto is out for, let's say, even if it's short term, a few weeks, I obviously now have no defensive cover. So do I want to make a transfer to make sure that I have a defender to cover me? If Gusto's just back immediately, let's say that it was just a little twinge, it's not a serious injury and he's back, then great. I don't need to make a defender transfer. But if he is out for a few weeks or maybe even longer term, I may be more likely to make a defender transfer. But could I just make that in 32 instead when I get a bit more information? Do I need to make a defender transfer this week, given that they would probably just sit on my bench anyway? It may well depend on if I get any further injuries or any further injury updates to some of my attackers. Maybe I'm just thinking, Do you know what, I just want a bit of defensive cover. I'll make the defender move this week. 
I'd love to know what you think in my position. Would you make a defender move or would you just sit with the starting 11 that I've got? It will largely depend on the Gusto update. So unfortunately, I'm having to record this on Sunday evening. Once we get a Gusto update, I'll share that on my socials. Make sure you're following me. I'll discuss it obviously in the deadline decisions video and also my deadline stream. And that will make the decision a little bit easier. If you want to know which defenders I'm considering to replace either Gusto and or Lascelles, I'll discuss that in the final section when we take a look at my watch list because I think there are still quite a few decent cheap defenders. Not as good as Gusto and Lascelles, which is why I picked them on my wild card, but there are still some decent picks. So don't feel like you've got to go and spend loads of your money in the bank. There are some cheap picks below 4.5 that I think could be very nice. So fingers crossed that the four that I have in my starting 11 are fine. Let's move on to the four-man midfield. So moving on to the four-man midfield, it's incredibly template, but incredibly strong. It's Parmesan Saka Salah. It is probably the best midfield four that you can get. They continue to return these players. They're all on penalties and they've all got good fixtures this week. I would argue that Palmer's might even be one of the stronger ones. That's the only one on paper you'd look at it and go, oh, that's not ideal. But Palmer against United, Son against West Ham, who continue to defend very, very poorly. We saw that again against Newcastle. And then Saka and Salah against Luton at home and Sheffield United at home. That is the best midfield four that I think you can possibly get. And therefore, I'm very, very happy to own them. And I suppose there's not that much to say on them. I do think captaincy is a discussion to be had. But I think most people would agree that Salah is still the standout captaincy option. I don't think you should feel like you have to captain him. There's definitely the ability to weave here and go for someone else slightly different and differential. But just know that you are going to be backing against one of the highest owned players we'll get this season. Everyone's going to bring in Salah. Everyone's going to captain Salah. He'll be at about 160, 170% EO. So if you're going to back against owning him altogether, good luck. I, I like it as a brave decision, but I wouldn't want to do it. Captaincy may be a little bit easier to do. But just for me, Sheffield United are just really bad. I know they had a much better performance against Fulham, and maybe that might put you off slightly. And Salah does look a little bit rusty, but it's Salah. He had 12 shots. I mean, in, and like I said, in another game week, that could be three or four attacking returns for him. And I just actually see that, that performance against Brighton as largely a positive thing for Salah. I don't look at that and think, oh, he's missed chances. I look at it and think, my word, he had, a, he had a lot of chances. And Liverpool will be going for goal difference here. And I think this is something which is maybe not being discussed enough. If it goes down to goal difference, Liverpool are quite, I think they're, oh, I don't know. I need to check this again, but they are behind Arsenal, certainly on goal difference. So Liverpool will need to score goals if they think there is a chance that it goes down to goal difference. So I think they'll be looking at this as their best chance to put quite a few goals past Sheffield United. No disrespect to Sheffield United, but this is their best remaining fixture. So I would not be surprised to see Liverpool go out there and go for the juggler and really go for four, five, six goals. So for me, Salah is the standout captain, but I'd love to know down below if you are considering going against him. I suppose the only doubt really is around Bakayo Saka, who obviously was flagged going into game week 30. We knew that he would start though, and he did. But he did go off early with the physio next to him. Arteta, after the game, said that it was just fatigue. I have said before though, I think if Arteta says that, Ar uh, that Saka's fine, I think Saka's probably injured. And if he says Saka's injured, I think Saka's probably fine. So Arteta saying that Saka only went off with fatigue, I don't necessarily buy that immediately. So I would like an update on it. But generally, he did walk off. Didn't look like there was a particular injury. It probably was just fatigue. If it was fatigue, though, and if they are looking at this and thinking they need to have a strong end to the season, I'm not for a second saying I think that Saka will be rested. But if there is a Premier League game to rest Saka, it's a midweek game against Luton at home. I also do think that this could just be a tricky game, though, for them. Luton can give the opposition troubles at least sometimes. And therefore, I still don't think Saka will be rested. But I just want to raise the possibility, at least, not to uh, scaremonger or anything like that, but just raise the possibility that if there is a fixture to give Saka a rest, this would be the one. But for me, I just can't see it. I think Artis has got to play strongest 11 every single week. So this midfield four is looking good. Like I said, I would not be benching Palmer this week. Lots of people will have a headache. Maybe if rather than Garnacho, you've got Foden or something like that, or maybe like a Meniz in attacking. You're like, oh, actually, I might play just play Palmer. Manchester United are that bad. They're 16th this season for expected goals conceded. They were they conceded the most big chances non-penalty in game week 30 as well. They are one of the worst defences in the Premier League and Palmer is in a brilliant run of form all season. He's been excellent. He's on penalties. It's at home. Please play Palmer. I do not recommend benching Palmer this week. So for me, I've got Garnacho on the bench against Chelsea away. I'm perfectly happy. It's one of the reasons I picked him is because I'm happy benching him most weeks. He's very, very cheap. Hopefully he doesn't need to come on, but if he does need to come on, Chelsea aren't the strongest defence in the world. They're a little bit suspect, so maybe he could get something. But largely, I'm very, very happy with my midfield four. Let's move on to the three forwards. 
So moving on to the three forwards, I have Haaland, Isaac, and Darwin. And if I were to build a game week 31 wildcard draft, generally I don't think the team would differ too much other than obviously Gusto and Lascelles, but I am pretty sure that this would be my front three once again. The only reason that this would differ, and by the way, people are asking for a game week 31 wildcard draft. I'll see if I can squeeze one in to one of my videos. The only reason that it would differ from this three is if you don't have your free hit left, I would arguably still go for Solanke instead of Isaac, even given how good Isaac's been. If you don't have the free hit in 34, you're probably going to want Solanke in for that week. And he's, he's got good fixtures over the next few as well. So Isaac versus Solanke, depending upon your free hit strategy, is the only thing that would make me change this front three of Haaland, Isaac, and Darwin. All of them are playing at home as well. And most of my players in my starting 11 are playing at home as per game week 30, by the way. And I, I like it when a lot of my players are playing at home. I tend to get higher scoring game week. So really happy with the front three. I know Haaland looked very poor against Arsenal, but in general, pretty much all attackers look poor against Arsenal because they are that good defensively, especially the forwards. I don't think people realize how good Saliba and Gabriel are at just neutralizing any attacker. They just don't give them the chances. So I wouldn't buy into that too much. I know that he obviously had a very poor game again against Arsenal earlier in the season. I just think that was always very, very likely to happen. Maybe less likely to happen at home, but I wouldn't buy into that too much. And I, I generally think that Aston Villa at home is a decent fixture for Erling Haaland. Always prefer him playing at home. I think Villa are a team that will give him space in behind as well. And I'm expecting him to get an attacking return if I'm to predict in game week 31. People that went without Haaland on their wildcards are probably laughing right now and going, see, he's not as good as he once was. And he definitely looks a little bit rustier at the moment. And he doesn't look quite the same. But with the fixtures coming up, especially Luton at home coming up very, very soon. I'm expecting Haaland to get some attacking returns. So I am still happy, despite the blanking 30, that I did go with Haaland in this wildcard draft. Isaac is just, I, I love him. He saved the wildcard, obviously. And like I said in the, the first section of the video, the thing that I'm loving most about Isaac now is how fit he looks. Obviously, we know Isaac is an exceptional finisher. He'll get chances. He takes penalties. The fixtures were good. We knew all of that around Alexander Isaac. But what I was a little bit unsure about is he's just played two lots of 90 minutes in the international break for Sweden. Is he going to come back and look really fatigued? He just looks so fit at the moment. And that's the key thing for Isaac. If he can stay fit, I think most people would have him in their team all season. He's that good. Everton at home isn't a perfect fixture. We know at points Everton have defended fairly well this season, but Newcastle are stronger at home. Isaac will be feeling very confident off the back of that performance in game week 30. So I'm feeling very, very happy having him. So not much more to say on him. If you are looking to bring in Isaac this week, I love it unless you're free hit 34. Sorry, unless you're not free hitting in 34, in which case it's just very difficult because he doesn't have an ideal fixture that week, doesn't double. Really where Isaac's value lie is probably this week, but then beyond that, it's from game week 35 onwards when they play against Sheffield United, Burnley, and then obviously they double too. So from 35 onwards, I think pretty much everyone will have Isaac, but whether you bring him in now does depend on your free hit strategy, I think. But there are points to be had in the meantime. And then finishing off with Darwin, who will probably be the most popular transfer in this week for forwards. Obviously didn't play particularly well in game week 30, but Darwin does accumulate chances. And I think, as I said, I expect Liverpool to go, go for goal difference in this game. They won't go there to win one or two nil. It's at Anfield, one of their easier games this season. They need to put quite a few goals past Sheffield United. And it's a statement of intent as well to Arsenal and to Man City, just to say we are going to win the title. So... I am expecting an absolute massacre here. I could be wrong. We've seen it in the past where teams do surprise us, but everything points towards this being like 3, 4, 5 nil, maybe even more than that. Again, maybe Sheffield United will surprise us, but Darwin is a player where, despite the fact that he didn't look great in game week 30, I would still expect him to start in 31 because Gakpo just has not been performing well towards the back end of the season. Across the whole season, he's been fantastic, but especially recently, I'm expecting Darwin to start and I think he will get the chance to get some attacking returns. Hopefully he makes up for the fact that he blanked in game week 30. I would love to know down below, who are you looking at for your forwards this week? Like who are the three forwards you're going to be owning? Are you looking to bring Darwin in? Are you looking to bring Isaac in? Are you maybe still looking at the likes of Solanke ahead of game week 34? Or are you maybe going for a cheaper option like Mateta or Cunha if he's available? But I'm very, very happy with my front three. So that is the team going into game week 31. If I'm expecting that Saka is going to be available, assuming that I don't get any other updates around players that I didn't realize were injured, I should have 11 players with Garnacho on the bench. My issue is, as I said, if Aitnuri, Yuri, Udogi or Bradley do miss out, and we're assuming that Gusto is injured for this week, plus Lascelles out for the season, I could be in a position where I don't have three fully fit defenders. So I think for me, the most likely transfer that I would make this week would be a defender to come in for Gusto or Lascelles. If it is Gusto that's being sold, and the only way I would do that is if we get newsies out for a very long time. Otherwise, I'd prefer to sell Lascelles. But if it is Gusto, I'd have up to about 5.4 million, I believe. So a little bit more 
flexibility with who I bring in. If I sell the cells, I have 5.1 million to spend, which does give me some flexibility. But to be honest, most of the defenders I'm looking at are below 4.5 million. So with that being said, that's the starting 11. Let's now take a look at my watch list and players that I might potentially be looking to bring in this week and in future weeks too. So guys, as I said in the previous section, the most likely thing for me this week is to roll. But if I do need to make a defender transfer, I absolutely will. And therefore, here are the defenders that I'm currently considering. Remember that I am free hit 34, bench boost 37. So I don't need a defender that doubles in 34 or has a good fixture in that week. But I do ideally need a defender that either doubles in 37 or just has a really strong single fixture. So four of the defenders I'm considering double in 37. And one of them just has a very, very strong home fixture. The other thing to consider, though, is also Game Week 33. So just to the side of me, I've pulled up the fixtures for Game Week 33. The reason I'm looking at 33 is currently the defenders that I own right now don't have the best fixtures. And ideally, the defender that I bring in would have a decent fixture that I don't mind playing them for in Game Week 33 too. But really, I'm just focusing more so on Game Week 37. So the only defender here that doesn't double in 37 is Branthwaite. But that's because he plays against Sheffield United at home in 37. And outside of that, the fixtures are really good too. So could I see Branthwaite outscoring someone like a Van Heck in 37? Well, if he keeps a clean sheet, absolutely I could. And he's also decent for bonus points and he's decent from corners as well. So I do really like Branthwaite and he's super cheap. The issue is, as I spoke about game at 33, they play against Chelsea away could potentially do well and I don't have to play him I could play one of my players from the bench instead but my fixtures just aren't looking great for that week and if I can ideally op optimize the points not only in 37 but in other weeks as well I would potentially like to do that and obviously he doesn't double and you get two bites of the cherry if you bring in a doubler in 37 so maybe it makes a little bit more sense to do so then we move on to who is likely my most likely option at the moment which is Van Heck lots of people would have picked Van Heck on their wild card I'm not overly blown away by him as an option. Brighton are decent enough defensively, although they conceded quite a few chances to Liverpool. But generally this season, their defensive data is good and the fixtures aren't bad. In 33, he plays against Burnley away. So if I do need to rely on him in 33, that's great. And no, the double isn't perfect in 37, but he does double in 37 too. So when I'm looking at the weeks that I need to play this player, Van Heck just, I think, suits my team the most. And again, he's very cheap himself. So if I'm looking at most likely options to come in at the moment for Lascelles, it probably is Van Heck, but it's not a particularly exciting transfer. He has had a little bit of attacking data recently, by the way. He's not completely void of attacking data, but he's not one of the more attacking players like potentially like a Gusto or an Aitnuri. So I think I'll temper my expectations, bring him in and just hope that in the weeks that I need him, he can deliver me something. Van de Ven is an option. Obviously not fully back fit right now, but once he is fully back fit, a very, very good option for considering the fact that I've got my third Spurs spot open. Double Spurs defense, no, isn't great, but we know that he's got a double-double at some point. My issue with Van, Van de Ven is, again, in 33, he's got Newcastle, which is obviously why I'm not particularly keen on playing you doggy if I can help it. So I don't want to bring in another Spurs defender for that week. And also the fixtures outside of the fact that they obviously do double twice, they're not particularly great. And this also blocks me from getting someone like a Richarlison. So Van de Ven is an option, but probably one of the least likely options for me. I've then got Maguire. Maguire could potentially be an excellent option, but it's largely dependent upon the injuries to other players in the defense. I think if everyone is fully fit in that Man United defense, the two centre-backs would be Varane and Lissandro Martinez. However, Varane can just not stay fully fit. He came off once again in game week 30, and Mart Martinez is obviously struggling with fitness himself, but looks to be hopefully back. I think if Varane is out, it will probably be Maguire at right centre-back and Martinez at left centre-back. Although Lindelof could potentially play, he's just not particularly good. And he's not been performing for Manchester United particularly well this year. And he could even be rotated with Wan-Bissaka at left-back with Dallow at right-back. So I think if Varane is out semi-long-term, or at least we just don't know when he'll be back, then I do really like Maguire. I'm just concerned that if Varane isn't out long-term, it could be Varane at right centre-back and Martinez at left centre-back. It could be potentially that we push Martinez out to left back and Maguire at left centre back. But I just think that partnership of Varane and Martinez is our best partnership. So Maguire would only be an option for me if we find out that we have some injuries in the defence that might, might potentially mean that he's nailed. However, Man United are just so bad defensively. Again, I'm not blown away by Maguire as an option. I don't mind it. And I do think I'll probably have one of Onana, Dallow or Maguire before game week 37. But I'm not sure I want to use a transfer bringing a Man United defender at the moment. The only other option is maybe going for a Man City defender. Ake went off injured in game week 30. And Gvardiol has just been brilliant at left back recently. He was actually one of the better players on the pitch. Maybe one of the best players on the pitch in game week 30 against Arsenal. 
And I think he will continue to get starts in the running for Manchester City. No, no one is ever fully nailed. But in the weeks that I need him, he's not ba bad at all. He's got Luton at home in game week 33, doubles in 37. So Gvardiol or another Man City defender could be an option for me too. Obviously, they'll be slightly more expensive than the other options that I'm considering. So those are the defenders that I'm looking at at the moment to replace Lascelles and potentially Gusto too. At the moment, I think it is probably most likely to be Van Heck. On the midfielders, I'm not really considering anyone that much at the moment. I do still think Havertz is a great option. Obviously, didn't get much against Manchester City, but I think that was largely due to the state of the game. Havertz, I think, for game week 31 against Luton and for the Dublin 34, if you're not free hitting in that week, is really, really nice. But for me... I don't really want to make a midfield transfer and he's certainly not a priority. And then Phil Foden is probably the most likely to come in for me. If I were to make a midfield transfer, let's say Saka was injured or something like that, I'd probably move to Phil Foden because he just really suits my strategy and I like the fixtures coming up for Man City now. If I could have one extra midfielder at the moment, if I was allowed six mids, it would be Phil Foden. Finally, on the forwards, again, I don't feel the need to make a forward transfer. I love Haaland, Isaac and Darwin. But if I'm looking at future transfers, and if I were forced to make one, it would be one of Cunha or Hoyland. Cunha's got good fixtures in the week that I need him, actually. Luton at home in 35, Crystal Palace at home in 37. Good fixtures over the next few as well. I know I'm free hitting in 34 anyway, but Cunha could serve me until the end of the season as a cheap forward. And whilst I don't really want to bench boost with an attacker with only one fixture, I wouldn't mind bench boosting with Cunha. However, he obviously didn't play in game week 30, so I'd probably want to see him come back and get some decent minutes before I look at purchasing him. But ideally, I think the forward that I'd be most likely to bring in is Rasmus Hoyland. No, he was not particularly good against Brentford, but no one was in that Man United attack. But maybe again, Garnacho's enough. Do I want Garnacho and Hoyland in my team? They do have Burnley at home in game week 35. So I still think there's a good chance Hoyland comes in for me. But if Cunha comes back and looks good and Man United continue to look poor, maybe I'd just go for Cunha instead and just accept that he's got one less fixture than Hoyland. So those are the players that I'm currently considering. Like I said, there is no plan to make a transfer at the moment. If I look at my recommended transfers by the AI on Fantasy Football Hub, they also recommend that I roll the transfer. So in an ideal world, I will roll. If Gusto's out longer term and I feel like I am forced to make a defender transfer, it'll probably be one of the five that I'm considering here. And I would love to know down below in the comments, who would you bring into my defense if you had my team? So guys, there we have it. That is my Game Week 31 team selection. Hopefully you did enjoy it. And if you did, please do smash that like button. And if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. As I said, it is a midweek deadline, Tuesday evening for Game Week 31. So make sure you get your teams locked in before then. Until next time, which will be the deadline decisions tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.